last talk is from uh, Konstantinos Busmalis, who's a research scientist at now called Google DeepMind. And uh, he's working in the robotics group, and they did this really fascinating uh, piece of work on RoboCat, which uh, supposedly is uh, the large language model of robotics, or at least the foundational model of uh, robotics. Uh, yeah, I should clarify, there's no language here, but yeah. it's just going in. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, like the 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 frozen model that will that will be the foundation of future multi embodiment uh, intelligence. So, take it away, Constantinos. Uh, Thank you, and thanks for inviting uh, uh, this talk, uh, and thanks for all the presentations today. Thanks for being here, and it's the last talk, so um, thanks for your attention. So, I um, we we did switch to a different modality. So, we talked uh, primarily about language today. Uh, there was some talk on vision. And here, really, we're talking essentially about actions, and we're talking about very applied to the real world with all the complexities that come uh, with that. And um, RoboCat is a self-improving foundation agent for robotics. It's probably the first self-improving foundation agent for robotics. Um, and it took uh, a, a couple of years with, with a, a large dedicated team kind of working on this. Um, so I will try to capture most of it, but please ask as many questions as you want uh, later at the drinks. So let's um, let's talk a little bit about some of the advances that are kind of relevant for for this work. Um, the I will start with kind of what has been the main focus in robotics, also at DeepMind until very very recently. We have always been kind of trying to solve difficult tasks that uh, are uh, you know kind of single tasks here on the left you'll see some uh, some of the work that we did uh, a couple of years ago on on trying to solve stacking with diverse shapes and uh, that you know is a, again very very difficult it, it takes a lot of engineering a lot of research to actually solve these things in the real world um, but again these are kind of single embodiments single tasks or perhaps a small set of tasks that are again in a in, in a very kind of limited um, uh, setting with a, with a, with a single embodiment. Um, moving forward, kind of transformer uh, transformers kind of landed on us in in, in 2017, and since then we've we've seen a, an explosion of, of things, and especially in the last year um, around multitask learning in 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 in, in language and and computer vision uh, and more kind of relevant to to this work is uh, the work of, of Gato, which was also done at uh, DeepMind uh, from Scott Reed uh, uh, and others, which uh, really kind of posed the problem of control as uh, a sequence modeling. And um, it, the, the, this, this was a very generalist agent that could simultaneously with a single set of weights solve many, many different tasks. It could solve Atari, it could uh, caption images. It could chat to you, and it could even um, it could even solve some of this. Where let me find the, the pointer. Well, anyways, some of this task here on the on the left there. Um, now uh, and also Gato is the the kind of the basis uh, for for RoboCat. This is kind of the the model that we uh, built RoboCat on. There are some other parallel works that are almost orthogonal to the work that I will be talking about today. Uh, that are important. So there are language condition transformer policies uh, that uh, that are out there. There is a uh, work from from Nvidia, for example. Um, another notable work from Google DeepMind is from um, uh, uh, from, from the team in California, which uh, uh, published the Robotic Transformer One, and more recently, uh, I believe last month, it was the the Robotic Transformer Two model, um, which you know, uses language conditions uh, a transformer to act uh, in, in the real world and solves hundreds of, of simple tasks um, that can be done in a very kind of diverse uh, diverse settings and diverse backgrounds and that sort of thing. And there is a kind of an, another kind of parallel stream of work that has to do with planning and using kind of large language models um, to, to, to do the planning of, of, of how to like sequence tasks and things like that. The reason I'm saying all this in the first slide before we dive in is to kind of tell you, I'm really excited about this direction. I really think there's going to be breakthroughs coming in the in the field of robotics. Uh, so, you know, keep keep uh, keep watching in the in this space. So, I use some kind of grand, grandiose works here words here. So, self improving foundation agent for robotics. Let me kind of clarify uh, what we meant with that. 
Um, so we think that a foundation agent for robotics needs to be able to solve multiple tasks. And it also, um, these tasks need to be uh, dexterous. They need to be hard in the control space. We also would like a model like that to be able to leverage data that comes from different embodiments uh, and also from diverse heterogeneous data sources. That means that we have different observations, we have different action specifications, and, and these, are, these are things that are uh, very difficult and very important if we are to leverage whatever little data that exists out there. And kind of a reminder, we don't really have robotics data lying around on the internet. We don't have like a big image net for, for uh, robotics uh, experience data. And we would want a foundation agent uh, for robotics to not just be this kind of like data sponge for all this kind of experience from robots, but we would want this agent to be able to use that data so that it can adapt to new skills. It can, and we would hope that it would be able to be um, a very good kind of few shot learner uh, as is the promise with uh, this kind of transformer models. So the hope is that we can learn new tasks with a limited number of demonstrations that, that humans can, can provide. And finally, as data is very, very scarce, um, we hope that we can have an agent that can self-improve so that the agent itself can get better uh, at the tasks that it learns by just practicing and collecting more data that can then incorporate it back to have um, a, a better, bigger repertoire of, of skills. And this is what we tried to build essentially with RoboCat. So we started with, uh, let me try this pointer again. Oh, there you go. We started with a very large uh, uh, training data set with a diverse set of tasks from um, work that we had done before. And then we we put it all in a, uh, in, in a, in, in a RoboCat model, in a, in, in a transformer that was a multitask, multi-embodiment transformer, which we instructed with visual goals. So we gave it a goal, uh, uh, we, gave a, we gave a goal of what we wanted the, the model to achieve um, and the model uh, went out and acted it out in the, in the environment. What we then uh, were able to do with uh, uh, such, a, such a model, we were able to collect some demonstrations of a new task that the agent had not seen before. Uh, and we, we were able to collect demonstrations within a, an afternoon. So we're talking about like 100 to 1,000 demonstrations uh, of a new task. And we we were able to have spin-off agents. So we, we were able to fine-tune that big RoboCat model on this new task and then have that uh, a new fine-tuned agent specialized to this task generate a lot more data in the order of like 10,000 episodes, I think it was on average, and then take that data, put it back to the uh, big training set and start training again from scratch. And, you know, we could we we could re repeat that loop again and again. Uh, and we, we only did this, I think, twice. So what is the, the model itself? So I, I already mentioned that RoboCat is based on, on Gato. That means uh, it's a, a, a decoder-only transformer. It's uh, uh, vision-based. So that means you really just get pixels in, we output actions. And um, as I have already mentioned, it's a, uh, the model is instructed with, uh, with visual goals. So here, this would be a, a kind of a typical visual goal we would give to the transformer and in this instance, the transformer would kind of um, uh, understand that we want to build this kind of structure, uh, this uh, little tower with this with these objects, and the the model would uh, be able to output actions conditioned on the observations that the environment uh, gives it. So it would it would it would see the observation tokens, it would output some action tokens according to the specifications of the environment uh, until uh, the end of the sequence. A very important modification to uh, how we um, uh, we trained this model is that we had a VQ GAN encoder for all our images. This was particularly important because with the kind of data we had, training was very, very slow. Uh, and this enabled uh, fast fast training and iterating uh, with uh, the, the, the model. And what I'm showing here on the right is kind of the, the broad data set of images that we used we use kind of image nets, a, 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 a lot of different kind of robotics data sets that um, we had and some public ones. Also, um, you'll notice perhaps um, some examples from uh, defined control suites at the bottom here. 
uh, and I'm showing also kind of the reconstruction quality uh, for some of these images. So this was kind of like a fundamental building block. And with this uh, visual goal conditioning, uh, asking uh, a robot guy to perform a task is simple. We show uh, a task, uh, the goal, we, we, we kind of captured the goal image, and then the, um, the agent uh, goes and performs the task. In this case, inserting a gear uh, in, in, this, uh, in this peg, in this pegboard. And like that, we can kind of interact uh, on the fly with, with a real robot in front of us. Right, so let me let me talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about the, the tasks in themselves. So we had uh, for the final Robocat model, we had two hundred and forty different tasks, and um, it was it was very important for us to to have tasks that are primarily uh, show some kind of multi object interaction. So when when objects actually interact with each other, the the control problem is, is a lot more more difficult. Um, so, so, th so, so thing kind of like lifting an object versus like stacking uh, two objects, uh, and and this is what you see uh, um, uh, on the on the top left there. So we had um, uh, different uh, different data sets that that came from different sources. So on the top left there, we had data that uh, was primarily on kind of structure building tasks, mostly in simulations. Some were um, uh, were also in the real world with sim to real from previous projects that uh, were uh, from experts, from reinforcement learning experts. Um, then in the middle, we, we have um, data that were on, on insertions and particularly kind of on gear insertions, like the, the example I showed earlier. And this was kind of the product of a large scale operation of collecting demonstrations in simulation uh, and the real world. And um, finally, on the right, we have um, other tasks uh, we have a lot. We have a lot more kind of structure building tasks uh, in the real world, uh, like you know, building a pyramid or a tower or or, or, or an inverse pyramid. That's that kind of kind of thing, and also um, lifting fruit and and vegetables, kind of like simpler, uh, simpler tasks that are, have more semantic meaning. And uh, for this, we collect some demonstrations, and then we use Robocat itself to self generate data. Uh, and this is how 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 we train the final Robocat model. Um, precision and dexterity is very important for these tasks. Like we really, need, we really need precision and dexterity to solve them. And um, a, a very important thing to highlight is that for this, uh, for for this data set, we have four different embodiments um, that actually have different action vectors. So um, some, some for some robots we had five degrees of freedom. For others we had seven degrees of freedom. Uh, for some tasks. The control frequency was 10 hertz, so we were outputting 10 actions a second. For others, it was 20. Um, so there was a, a lot of uh, variability in in in, the, in this experience, uh, and Robocat was able to uh, to deal with that uh, without without an issue. Um, and also, it was able to deliver in the adaptation in the few shot promise, as I will uh, show you now. So. Um, it, it, for the next couple of slides, I will I will talk about some of these adaptation cases. And on the top, you can see kind of how the training data looked like. I already talked about um, uh, what what kind of this data looks like. And in this case, um, we uh, we applied this. We applied Robocat, which we fine tuned on on just a thousand demonstrations uh, for each of nine uh, tasks. This was insertion. Uh, and removal tasks, uh, so like inserting this fruit in the blue bowl and removing this fruit uh, uh, from the bowl as well. Uh, and although we have seen these objects uh, in the training set, we have not seen the blue bowl and we have not seen this particular task. And with just a thousand demonstrations, we were able to to solve them quite uh, adequately, actually, uh, which was uh, uh, surprising to us that the the that the, that the um, performance was was that high and it was uh, much much higher than kind of any other uh, baselines we we tried and we tried we tried a lot uh, as you can see in the paper if you want uh in uh, in a different uh, case we also tried some um, much harder tasks in this case we have completely different objects we've never seen during training completely different tasks this is uh, kind of like a shape matching uh toy that toddlers play with actually this was Literally, my daughter's uh, uh, game um, that I destroyed, unfortunately. Um, uh, um, and um, 
for this case, the we the the performance might seem particularly low. All sixty baselines were zero for this. The task is very hard; it requires a reorientation before you do the insertions. And actually, we were we were surprised we even got thirteen percent for the insertions. And you can see for the removals, for actually removing things out of that out of those uh, of those holes, uh, it was almost a, a, a thousand. Uh, sorry, a hundred percent. Another reason why uh, the, the performance is a little bit low is because with a thousand demonstrations, it's really hard to kind of capture all that state space, especially if you haven't seen the objects and this particular kind of reorientation skills. And, and the kind of most mind blowing thing for me, to be honest, I didn't think this would work. Uh, we just kind of tried it, uh, was that we tried it on a completely different uh, embodiment that was new to the lab. We never, we never played with it, so we didn't know what would happen really. So. As a reminder, we have robots that take actions that are five or seven, let's just say, and um, and we and all these robots have, have parallel groupers, so that they have a particular kind of um, visual appearance, if you will, in the observations. Now, this new robot that we used has fourteen degrees of freedom, has three fingers that are actually actuated, uh, they have like actually actuated joints in the fingers, um, and 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 it looks very very different. Right, and with a thousand demonstrations, we were able to uh, to to re kind of do tasks that we saw in the in the training set uh, as well, which uh, uh, for us was 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 pretty pretty surprising. Um, we were very happy to see this, and um, after after kind of the uh, we, we put the paper out on archive, we we kind of repeated that uh, experiment with other tasks as well. So um, after all this training and fine tuning, we have a model that. We have shown to be able to do a lot of perform a lot of tasks uh, that that require dexterity, or you know, over two hundred fifty tasks, I believe, with um, five uh, uh, different embodiments. I will I will briefly talk about some capabilities of uh, the model. There's a lot more meat uh, to, to 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 all of this, but I think some of the things that might um, you might want to hear about is the cross task transfer capabilities that we saw. This is something that. Um, Gato, the, the model that we were basing on, um, uh, did not show very explicitly. And we were able to see this perhaps because of the kind of narrower robotics domain. Um, and let me let me explain a little, little bit what you see here. So every bar is a different um, uh, task family. Uh, so it's a collection of tasks. So every bar kind of like corresponds to like 30, 30 tasks, uh, uh, more or less. And this corresponds to the tasks that we use to train the initial RoboCat model, right? So this is the, the task that we use to train the initial RoboCat model. And the performance of the initial RoboCat model is in red. Now, the final RoboCat model, so this is a, a, a RoboCat model that includes more tasks and self-generated data is in blue. So what, we, what this kind of says is that more data and tasks improve the performance on the original training tasks, right? So this is, again, this is the original training task. So this is a fair comparison. And we see that it, the performance goes up across the board. And we see uh, an even kind of um, more uh, uh, stark um, difference when we go to fine tuning capabilities. Here, the initial RoboCat model is in the kind of a lighter blue there. Um, this is an average, uh, um, success rate over nine fine tuning tasks that were held out for both the initial and the final model, right? So these are tasks that we have not seen during training for either model. The initial RoboCut model is able to do approximately 36% on average. The final RoboCut model is, is going all the way to 74%. Again, so again, adding more data, including the self-improvement, um, makes the RoboCut model a lot better at fine tuning. Of course, I have to caveat this, especially if the data is relevant, right? So in the process, we did see more, more experience with those particular robots that we used for these tasks. We did see these objects in, in some of the uh, episodes in different tasks, but we did see them. So just kind of saying that caveat there for the big, the big jump. In recap, what have I told you today? I talked to you about uh, uh, the first, I believe, self-improvement, self-improving uh, foundation agent for robotic manipulation. Uh, we call it RoboCat. It's a model that can solve a, a, a large set of dexterous tasks on multiple real robotic embodiments, which is the first time that happens. It's able to adapt to um, to unseen tasks, and we have we are showing in the paper that it's really lowering kind of the cost of acquiring new skills uh, with demonstrations. 
and most importantly, it can really use uh, the, 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 the data that it self-generates, it can self-improve, and it performs better for it, and it performs better as we scale uh, the training data and as we diversify the training data with more, uh, with more tasks and more examples. Directions, sky's the limit now. So there's a lot of different uh, um, kind of directions in, in robotics. Uh, in the space of kind of embodied foundational models, as, as I said uh, in the beginning of the talk. For this particular work, kind of some of the obvious avenues, reinforcement learning can really help. Um, so we only use behavior cloning here. So we're just kind of like doing supervised learning, predicting the actions. Um, but we, we think that reinforcement learning could really help, especially at fine tuning time. We are only using vision instructions. Um, there are reasons for that, ask me outside perhaps. Um, but I, combining vision with language and maybe videos would probably uh, be a very, a very good next step. Uh, pushing the task boundaries uh, of what we can do with more precision, more dexterity, I think would be fantastic. Uh, and it would really help us kind of um, uh, keep going and like uh, incorporating more and more tasks. And then kind of architecture, architectural improvements, longer context, uh, um, better conditioning, using... Uh, the large VLMs that are available to kind of help and you know be able to solve even more tasks, um, uh, you know, at, at a different level, right? So this would not particularly help with dexterity, for example. Um, yeah, those are those would those would all be very interesting. This was uh, a large team. Robotics requires a lot of people, especially when you're talking about multiple platforms. Um, having one platform with a couple of robots is hard. Imagine having multiple platforms with tons of robots. You really need a lot of people. And uh, this was a really, really large team effort for over uh, two years, I believe. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, it's really uh, a quite a specific uh, loss function that you use there, uh, the loss of your own daughters. Uh, toys. So uh, <laughs> I think uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to see more papers on that, how they generalize. But watch out, we have journalists in the room. So I can see the headline, Google DeepMind destroys children's toys to train universal robots. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we have time for a few questions. Thank, thanks for a really fascinating talk. And quite amazing work. Um, it also seems to show how hard robotics really is, right? Because only a thousand demonstrations at fine tuning time, still a thousand demonstrations at fine tuning time. I was kind of curious uh, how far we could push this. It feels like the demonstration data that you use is still really closely related to the domain you want to test on. And compared to you know where we are with large language models, actually pretty small data sets still. What's stopping us, say, grabbing loads of video data? Do we need percent? Do we need in like a uh, interaction, or could it be just observational data? Very, very good question. Um, so a thousand demonstrations is is a little actually. If you consider, is, is quite a few. If you consider what um, what you're modeling, uh, but I, no, no, I agree. I, I agree. I, I know. I, it's, I, it's I agree. Right? Amazing by where the state no, of the no, art is, no. but I can do it in one. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just saying. Like it's a. Uh, uh, you're very right. Um, no, nothing stops you from using video data. Uh, I do think you need interactions, and that's what we don't have. Uh, we don't have like you know you can you can get very far with just using uh, uh, vision data and some of the work. Like I, I urge you to, to to look at like uh, RT two. Uh, if you Google RT two, uh, you'll see of some of the really cool things that you can do uh, with um, with using like visual language models. And, and um, I do. The, it's it's an open it's an open question how we utilize for example human hand data there's some some data sets out there uh or like kind of you just just a really small follow-up like given that you guys are now like google DeepMind, why why not all of youtube say or something like that so again it's it's about it's about well first of all how you would how would you test that really all right um uh, do we have enough tasks for example to really evaluate such an application that would be a question right uh, but also really in order to solve some of the uh, the, the kind of the low level control problems that would I, I don't know how that how much that would help. Um, but yeah, that's a very interesting research, uh, research direction. Great. Questions in the back uh, here. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I have a question. How much inspiration is there from how animals or humans do it? Because I imagine when we're 
manipulating objects, we're not only seeing it, but we're also feeling it. So this the multimodality is more than just vision. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very. So I, if, if I'm if I if I can interpret your talk is how do we incorporate things like um, uh, proprioception and, and and touch, for example, um, and tactile and and excellent research direction. Very hard questions, like in very very little data, very difficult engineering um, uh, questions. There, uh, it's something that I, I I would really like to see more of. Uh, but unfortunately, for example, simulating tactile data is extremely difficult. Um, there's not much. On, on that tactile sensors are uh, are few and not working fantastically well and uh, you know processing all that data and and, and uh, is, is is at a very embryonic stage I think still unfortunately uh, thank you for the presentation I was wondering if you have benchmarked uh, this approach versus palm e approach on previously unseen uh, tasks. Um, so Palmy is more um, uh, on on the it's it's kind of like orthogonal in a sense, right? So this would Palmy would be more about like, like the, the sequencing task and like planning and kind of uh, question answering. So the short short answer is no, uh, but uh, again, it's like something something orthogonal that would be very interesting to see what next stages uh, would look like. All right, one last question here. Ken, perfect, thanks. Yeah, so. Um, very exciting, exciting work. I'm just kind of curious, just moving on the application side. So, uh, I mean, obviously there's a lot more uh, potential for this uh, in terms of scaling up, but I mean, what what do you see in the next, the coming years? Do you imagine that like, I don't know, in uh, two, three years time, and then you can, uh, you know, you have a robot in a factory, you want it to do different tasks, and that, you know, with a thousand demonstrations using something like this, uh, you can quickly uh, adapt those uh, those robots to those tasks. And you know what? I guess also not to overload the question too much, but what are the challenges do you see uh, to that kind of future if you do anticipate that? Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, good question. I uh, it's hard to predict the future. I I I have to say. So I didn't when when we started working on this kind of like half a year before that, I didn't know that we would even be able to do something like this uh, right before Gata was available, and we saw some of this so saw some of this preliminary. Um, uh, results. What what I want to see, I want to see us lower even further, as as you said also, um, the kind of the cost of acquiring new skills. Thousand demonstrations is a lot for simple tasks like lifting. Um, we should we really need to be dropping this down, and we want to be doing a lot better with a thousand demonstrations. I think that's that's even more important. So, um, you know, that's where you know I talked about like potentially using reinforcement learning and like rewards as a way to kind of communicating what you want the agent to do. Um, and kind of further down the future, I mean, we just want to be be able to communicate better uh, with with robots, and I, I, sky's the limit. I don't I don't know. 